persistence. Uh, does it pay? Does persistence pay? Yes. Sure it does. Yes. I mean, pick any discipline. I don't care what you're doing. If you're an artist, whatever. Uh, it pays to be persistent and diligent. Uh, my mother, who was in the last service because she flew out here, because she wants to come to the tour at two. And you know about the tour at two, right? Yeah. Awesome to go in the building. It's mind-boggling. So at two o'clock, between two and four, you need to be here. Close toed shoes, by the way. No rainbow sandals. Uh, you'll be sorry. So bring close toed shoes. Uh, but uh, my, my mom was here in the, in the last service. And she's, uh, she basically uh, roped me into playing the piano when I was younger. Uh, so I was a boy between two girls. And my sister Marla majored in piano, was an excellent pianist. But she uh, had me uh, go to a lesson with her one day. I played baseball. I didn't play the piano. And so I, she had me go to a lesson one day with my sister Marla and said, just sit in the chair. Just listen. See how you like it. So I did. And I, I was sitting there, and after the lesson, the teacher, Helen Kendrick, looked at me and said, uh, uh, it's your turn. <laughs> huh? She goes, well, your mother paid for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. So 10 years later, I went to college, and uh, then I took music composition stuff there. So um, I understand about, uh, like, from a, the importance of persistence when it comes to piano right? Because if you do not practice what they tell you to practice, you cannot play very well. Uh, and I will tell you, playing all those things they want you to play is boring. I mean, all the hand, hand, the hand in hand drills, up and down the keyboard, all the arpeggio studies, all the things you have to do. But if you want to get good, you have to do all those things. Um, so when I run into somebody like Lang Lang, the pianist, the, he's awesome. I don't know if you've ever heard him play the piano. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how he's able to play. But listen to what his parents demanded from him. And I told my mom in the last service, there's no way you would have got me to do this. This is how he started out his life with persistence. 5.40 a.m., his parents got him up on a school day. Uh, he woke up and he practiced the piano for one hour before breakfast. That would not have happened in my life. Um, 7 a.m., he went to school, he came home at lunch, uh, he, they allowed him to eat for 15 minutes and then before he went back to school he had to practice for 45 more minutes. Huh? Uh, then when he got home from school before dinner he had to practice for two more hours and then he ate dinner they limited him to 20 minutes for dinner uh, and then he had to after dinner practice for two more hours didn't do his homework then go to bed to get up again at 5.45 to practice again. He's how old? Five. <laughs> do you have a five year old in your house? Yeah. You can't even get up to, you can't even get them to pick up the toys, right? Let alone practice your arpeggios for two hours. No, that's how he started out. So when you see him play, uh, you can see just how profound he is at the keyboard. He makes it look totally effortless. Well, it, it's because he was persistent. Now when he lives a typical day, he plays three to four hours per day to stay on top of his game. And then when he's going to play a concert, he practices for eight straight hours a day. Persistence, does it pay? Yes, it does pay. Now, you might not be a, into the piano. You might be into gymnastics. Let's switch metaphors because you're like, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Let's go to another way. But well, we have a lot of gymnasts in our church because uh, they, they tell me so because they do it at school. So let's go to uh, and look at a gold medalist like uh, Simone Biles, okay? This young lady can do things that I think if I did them and landed after I did those things, I would see Jesus. I mean, just <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, she could do things with her body. It's like, that's not even human. How did she get to the point where she could do that? Well, if you study her life, she will tell you that she became a great gold medalist gymnast by practicing 32 hours a week, six days a week. Took one day off, but she pushed herself all those other days. So when you look at persistence, you must say it pays great dividends and disciplines when you apply yourself. Calvin Coolidge wrote these profound words as our late president. He says, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. He says, nothing is more, uh, more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? Some people are just driven with talent and do nothing with it. He says, genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Haven't you seen people that are extremely built, brilliant and do nothing with it? He says, uh, education will not. He says, the world is full of educated, what he calls derelicts. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, you ever work with somebody that's really smart and can't do the most base things? Unbelievable. He then adds this. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Wow. You want to do anything well? What does Coolidge say? You need to be persistent. Now, 
Paul could have easily said any of these things because if anybody was diligent and persistent, it is Paul. I mean, he was doggedly persistent. And when Paul looks at spiritual life and says, you want to grow up in the faith? What's it take? Laissez-faire, laid-back attitude. Are you here today? I don't know. You forgot you, forgot you can interact with me if I'm talking. I mean, do you, does it take a laissez-faire, laid-back, who cares attitude, manana, another day? No, no, you got to be doggedly persistent, which is why spirituality works well in the D D.C. area because everybody's so focused. <laughs> See, so well, Paul's telling us in Romans chapter 12 how to be radically righteous now that we're justified by faith. How do I grow up in the faith? Well, he says, let me tell you. And so if you go back and you look at verses uh, 9 and 10 that we spent many weeks so far studying, uh, he will tell you how to be radically righteous. I'm not going to go through all the commands he gave there. And they are commands in the Greek text. They're not suggestions. Their commands and their present tense commands, meaning you must learn to perpetually make these part of your life. So whether it is learning how to uh, avoid evil at all costs or learning how to take care of the body of Christ, this is something that you do all the time. It's not like, hey, Lord, I was gracious toward the body of Christ one time. I'm done. No, no, no. It's a lifestyle. So what he's going to say is if you want to really grow up in the faith, it's going to take a radical uh, persistence when it comes to prayer. If you really want to mature, this is what he says in verse 12 12c. Notice what he says. We'll quote the verse. These are the things you read quickly over. There's a whole lot there. What does he say? Well, by way of review, uh, you should be one who rejoices in, 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 remember, the hope. There's the article before the word hope in, in, the, in the Greek text. The hope, the eschatological return of Christ. Be excited about the fact he's coming back to establish true government. Aren't you worried about the world today, well, it's going to end with the appearance of Jesus. He says, uh, uh, be persevering in tribulation. You sh it should what, be what you do. We talked about that last time I was here. And then he tacks on another command. You should be devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer. Uh, the word here, this verbal concept of being devoted to prayer, again, is a preposition wedded to a verbal concept. So let's review. I've been gone for two weeks. I'm sure you remember this. If you take a preposition and you wed it to a verb, what happens? It intens the first row knows, praise God. How, how about if people in the back? What's it do? It intensifies the meaning. So take a word, stick a preposition in front of it, and it makes it intensified. That's what he's doing all through this passage. So he says when it comes to prayer, you should be devoted to it. But since he put a preposition before the, the word for devotion, he just said don't just be sort of devoted. No, be uber lang lang devoted. Lang lang the guy, the man, or Simone, or whatever. Be super devoted. So you have to stop and ask yourself the question, am I? Am I super devoted? Uh, it's very interesting, this uh, uh, proskaritero is the word. Uh, uh, Danker's Greek lexicon uh, gives you all the different lexical meanings from the ancient text uh, outside biblical literature. And it tells you, here, here's how it is used. It means to stick by or to be close at hand to somebody uh, it means to attach yourself to somebody so that you're always available. Uh, and because of that, it was used, it was a military term who referred to an aide to a commanding officer. That'll preach all day long here. <laughs> How many military are here today? Yes. Whatever your rank is, someone's over you. <laughs> Did you hear me? Have you realized this yet? <laughs> yeah. So if you're an army colonel, who's over you? General. Uh, gen what kind of general? Brigadier. Brigadier. What's he called? He's a brigadier general. Is he responsible to somebody? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who's over him? The major general. And then there's another one above him, right? And another one above him. And then who's over all of them? Commander-in-chief. Commander you know his name. The, the Trump is his name, yes. Who's over Trump? God. God. We, the we the people and God, <laughs> yeah. But this is what he's saying. Let me use a military term. You're in the Roman environment. You have soldiers everywhere in Rome. Everybody gets this word about devotion. It means you're readily available to the commanding officer. So if you are an aide to a general, he owns you, right? Right? Well, if you're a colonel and you've got a lieutenant colonel underneath you who's like your aide, that lieutenant colonel gets to know you real well. He's there. It's a symbiotic relationship, is it not? Or am I speaking to people that anybody understands us? So Paul says when it comes to prayer, you should be like readily available in prayer at all times to talk to God. Wow. So you have to ask yourself, what's the question again? Am I? am I? 
So this leads naturally in my mind to um, a couple of questions. When, since he commands us to be devoted in prayer, I want to know, number one, what does persistent prayer look like? I mean, what's that look like? Remember the old hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer? You, you don't remember this? Yeah, Sweet Hour of Prayer and that whole thing. You know, you think, when's the last time I had a Sweet Hour of Prayer? Well, I like the song. Doesn't mean I do it. What is it to you? Like Sweet Minute of Prayer because you're in D.C.? God, you know I'm busy. I got to check all my emails, you know, check out Instagram, see what's going on in the world. You know, all the things. I'm commuting. I'm slugging. They don't, you know, I can't talk on the car, etc. You know, I'm busy. The sweet minute of prayer. Okay. Does God hear a prayer that's a minute long? Yeah. Sure, sure he does. But, but sometimes you might need to spend more than in a minute in prayer, maybe a sweet hour of prayer. So what does persistent prayer look like in a righteous, maturing Christian life? So does it mean that, mean that you pray 24-7? Yeah. No. Because if you pray 24-7, you would get nothing done. You couldn't even fulfill the Great Commission. God, I cannot go out and evangelize because I'm so busy praying. No. No, that, it wouldn't work that way. Uh, it, so it doesn't mean that you pray all the time, but there might be times for prolonged prayer. Before I came here, I went to a, a, a monastery uh, for, for a reflection and solitude to figure out what does God want to do with my life? Does he want to do anything else than pastor the church that I'd been at for 20 years? So I went to a monastery in the Sierras. I'd never been to one before. And I mean, it was Catholic. I'm Baptist. I go there. I take my laptop with me and my cell phone. <laughs> They're laughing at me, I think, in the parking lot. You know, I came in. The bro I met the brother and, you know, it, I met the brother and he's like in this robe thing and I'm like, I'm, I don't think I could wear one of those. But it's like, you know, what do I do here? He goes, well, you need to check in first. So I, I got my little room and I opened the door and I'm like, whoa, it's like totally Spartan, you know. And he says, make, make sure when you're all done, there's down the hall is a little room, get your towels, replace them, everything. And we don't take care of the rooms. It's not a hotel. And I'm like, it's a monastery. Oh, okay. So I, I went in and I'm walking around, setting my computer down and everything and looking for the plug for my phone and stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm smart, but I got in limitations, I'll just tell you. And, and so, you know, after a while, I can't, I'm moving the furniture, I'm moving beds, I can't find an electrical plug. I can't even find a light. So I went and I found the brother and I stopped him. Oh and he's walking around, he's probably praying and meditating. I interrupted him and I'm like, uh, I got an issue with that room, there's no electricity. I, I, how, how can I plug my computer in if I can't find electricity. There isn't electricity. Why not? It's a monastery. Okay, so why? I mean, <laughs> I said, well, how am I going to connect with God if I can't get on my cell phone and my laptop to do my spiritual stuff? He goes, you're not going to need that here. I'm like, Unbel this is, place is unbelievable. And so I got used to it. I just took my stuff to the car, locked it in the trunk, went back to the room and uh, so when I hooked up with the, with the brothers later, uh, I said, well, hey, what do you want me to do here? They said, well, uh, for today, we want you to uh, pick this, uh, this verse here we were showing you in the Psalter, and we want you to walk out into the forest, just kind of hike out. There's no trails. Just, you know, just head out into the forest by yourself and find a place to sit down somewhere and don't come back here until you've prayed for three hours over that one psalm. Excuse me? Three hours over one psalm? What am I going to say? That's what you must do. And so I did. I went out of the forest. I sat down on a, on a log. And I got real familiar with that one psalm for three hours. And I don't, it turned out to be one of the most profound things I've ever done. Have you ever done that? Got away with God. And it was more than a sweet hour of prayer. It was three hours of prayer. I'd never done that before. I was a pastor. But it was profound because God gave me wisdom and insight as I studied and prayed and meditated over that. So what does profound prayer look like? Well, sometimes it's getting off like that and having a long time with God. But mostly I would say it's just an attitude of prayer. That you're so connected with God, you think about him all the time, that when things happen in a given day, you just talk to him. It's just like natural. Think about Moses. Think about Moses. He was in prayer all the time as the leader of Israelites with his people because they constantly had issues. Did they not? I mean, think about it. Let's just look at some of them. Um, when uh, he sent out the 12 spies into the land to take the land of promise, they've already seen the 10 plagues. They've already seen our God can part the Red Sea. So taking the land of promise should be no problem. The 10 spies, came, or 12 came back and 10 of them said, no way, can't do it walled fortresses to infinity, weaponry beyond our weaponry. I mean, we can't do it. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb said, no problem, God's with us. God got angry with the other 10, wanted to take them out. I mean, remove them from the planet. Moses then stepped in uh, in prayer. And Moses said, God, if you take out 
these disbelieving Israelites, he says, he's arguing with God. By the way, have you ever argued with God in prayer? You're laughing because you have. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, you know, let me give you some advice. If you are going to debate with God in prayer, he's an excellent debater, by the way. If you're going to debate with God in prayer, always preface it with some, re- it with some really good things to let him know that you know who he is. Don't waltz in with your argument. I always waltz in by prefacing it by saying, God, I know that you're holy, you're just, you're mighty, you're, et cetera. B- but I do have, an, or, I do have a, something I need to kind of talk through with you, <laughs> something that I don't quite get. Notice what he says to God. Uh, he says, if you do this, God, and remove the Israelites, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For by, the, by thy strength, uh, thou didst bring your people up from their midst. And then they're going to tell what you did, in eliminating your people, to the inhabitants of this land. I mean, God, you certainly don't want the word out. You wiped out your people. I'm adding to the text, by the way, if you're wondering. Yeah. Uh, uh, then then, then they, the, the, they that have heard that you, O Lord, art in the midst of this people, for you, O Lord, are, are seen eye to eye by us, while thy cloud stands over them, thou didst go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Everyone can see you're with us. That cloud follows us everywhere. And at night there's a swirling pillar of fire that illuminates the camp. Everybody knows you're with us. It says, now if you dost slay the people as one man, then the nations who have heard of it, of, of thy fame, will say, God, here's what the scuttlebutt's going to be in the region. Well, because the Lord could not bring his people into the land which he promised them by oath, therefore he slaughtered them into the wilderness. He's so limited. God, you certainly don't want to take that route, correct? But now I pray, let the power of the Lord be great just as thou hast declared the Lord is. God, let me remind you who you are. <laughs> this is bold. Uh, God, God, you are what? Slow to, Slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. No, notice the contrast, but... But he will by no means clear the guilty. You'll deal with sin, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. I get it. You'll deal with sin. But in this situation, I'm praying before your throne, be merciful to your people. How many times did Moses go between the people and God? See, your job is to keep me from having to do that a whole bunch. Are you hear me? I mean, I'm glad to do it and I do do it. You know, but it's like, how many times does a pastor have to go between me and God because I've blown it? That's Moses. I mean, he's living there. And he lives there in prayer to step in to say, Lord, don't, don't vaporize them yet. They're your people. Be merciful, be gracious. Um, when Aaron uh, threw all that gold in, into the hot fire and just out popped a, <laughs> a golden calf, it's kind of what he says. Uh, God wants to wipe out the Israelites again. And, and what's, what's Moses do? Uh, well, Moses, verse 26 of Deuteronomy 9 says, I prayed to the Lord and I said, when God wants to destroy them, O Lord God, do not destroy thy people, even thine inheritance, whom thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, whom thou hast brought up out of Egypt and with a mighty hand. Remember who they are, God, uh, and remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of this people or at their wickedness for their sin. Otherwise, the land from which thou dost bring them will say, he's going to say what the inhabitants will say again. He goes, God, you don't want to be talked about negatively. What's he doing with God? He's having a discussion with God. I mean, don't, don't be afraid to have a discussion with God. I mean, be honest with God. If you don't understand something, something strikes you the wrong way, you, don't, you can't kind of connect the dots on what he's doing, walk into his presence and tell him, Lord, I love you, I honor you, I see you're greater than I, but I just need to tell you how I feel about what just happened. But this is all happening in the context of prayer. Why? Because Moses had an attitude to prayer. So when Paul says be devoted to prayer, it's like Moses. An attitude of prayer that when something's going on, you, you go into the presence of God and have a, well, an honest conversation with him. See, this is the way Paul was. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 9 to 10, which we started there a long time ago, uh, he, he says this to the Romans. He says, God is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always making a request in prayer for you. What he translates that into our vernacular is, when I think of you Romans, when your name comes to mind, I stop and I pray for you. That's an attitude of prayer. It's an attitude of prayer. There's a lot of times, uh, I, the older I get, the less I sleep. Does that happen to you? Yeah. yeah, I'm up quite a bit during the middle of the night, just laying there. Am I, I, can, I have a hard time turning my brain off. My wife, go right to sleep. Does this happen to you? And I'll be laying there forever. Because my brain's just going. And then I'll finally go to sleep and then I'll wake up and it's like 1230. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? 
So, you know, so what do you do when you're up in the middle of the night? Pray. Pray. Talk to God. That's when I think of various people here whose prayer cards have come in. And I think of your name, I think of you. And that's when I say, God, so-and-so's having surgery tomorrow or so-and-so just lost their dad or whatever. And that's when I just say, God, would you give them peace? Would you give them wisdom? Whatever you need. And I just pray in the middle of the night. And then I'll go back to bed. But it's that, it's that attitude of prayer. Do you have an attitude of prayer? This is perpetual prayer. It's just you're so connected with God that you just can't wait to walk into his presence. Uh, there's a man named Ben Patterson who wrote a book, Deepening Your Conversation with God. You might want to read it. In that, uh, he talks about George Mueller, the great Victorian reformer. Notice how George Mueller prayed in his day for five friends who were not saved. George says, in November of 1844, I began to pray for the conversion of five friends. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether I was sick or healthy, uh, whether I was on land or on sea, and whatever the pressure of my engagements might be, I prayed for my five friends, their salvation. 18 months elapsed before the first of my friends was converted to Christ. He said, I thank God, and I continued to pray for the other four. Five years passed, then the second friend was converted to Christ. I thank God for the second conversion, and I prayed for the other three. He said, I thank God for that man, and I continued to pray. Six years passed, and the third friend was converted to Christ. I thank God for the three that were converted, and I prayed for the other two. For 36 years, he prayed for those other two. For 36 years. They did not come to Christ. But he said when interviewed, but I still had hope in God, and I still prayed, and I still asked, and looked for God to answer. In 1897, 52 years after he began to pray for those five friends, those last two friends came to know Christ, but it was only after George was dead and in the presence of Christ. Imagine the reunion day when those two friends died and wound up in heaven. And George, imagine the joy because he had prayed for them for 56 years. You have to ask, stop and ask yourself the question, how long do I actually pray for something? Oh, Lord, you know, I've been praying over my wayward daughter. I've been so hard praying for her. The Lord says, how long? Lord, it has been two weeks. I see no results. What's God say? You might, you might need two months. You might need to pray for two years. See, I think we give up all too easily. Paul says, no, remember to be devoted to prayer above all things. Why in the world, which leads to my second question, not only what is, what is an attitude of, or what does persistent prayer look like? It's an attitude of prayer. But, but why does God want us to be persistent? I mean, since he's omniscient and omnipotent, why after the first ask can he just do it? Could he? Yes, yeah. yeah, he absolutely could do it. Could God answer your prayer after the first prayer? Yeah, yeah sometimes he does. Shockingly so. But, but I've learned as I've grown up in him, he tends to answer them quickly when you're newer in the faith to show you his power. As you get older in the faith, he makes you wait a little bit to deepen your faith. Why should I, uh, why should I uh, be persistent, persistent in prayer when he is who he is? Let me give you some reasons. Number one, Christ was persistent. It works like this. Since my Lord was persistent in his prayer life, I can do no less. In the high priestly prayer that he prayed before he was crucified in John 17, verse 15, notice the wording and the verbiage. He says, I do not ask thee, speaking to the Father, to take them, Christians, out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one, the devil. Now notice he says, I do not ask, ask. This is a present tense verb in Greek. Uh, uh, erotao is the word. Uh, he's telling you in the verbiage of the word, the present tense nature of the verb, he hasn't just prayed this one time for you. He's prayed this many times for you. That, that, that he knows the devil's real. And according to 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. He knows the strategies of the devil. He, and he knew that the devil wanted to sift Peter. So what did he do? He prayed for Peter. See, so you have to stop and ask yourself, why should I be persistent? Because my Lord was persistent because he understood the devil. What holds the devil at bay? The prayer of a righteous person. So when's the last time you prayed for your daughter, your son who's away at college? When's the last time you prayed for your wife by name? God protect her from the evil one, etc. Prayed for your husband when he's on a, a trip with the military and then he's in some foreign land. God, pray, pray for my husband by name, etc. Uh, I saw a picture this week I found most instructive that applies to this. Baby, you saw it. Did you see this? Yeah. These guys are fishing. I love to fish. These guys are, I don't know if they're trout fishing or whatever they're doing. Uh, there was a na nature photographer right behind him and, and I took a picture of these two guys as he's hiking out in the forest. He just takes a picture of the two fishermen who are like, whoa, this is cool. There's a photographer. What's behind them? It's a bear. Now, this is not a typical bear. This is a what? 
a grizzly bear. What's the grizzly bear? The, I don't mind brown bears, and I saw them all the time in California. They're not too scary. Grizzly, they scare, they scare me. I mean, these are the kind of things, you're lunch to them. <laughs> these guys are fishing. What's the bear looking for? Lunch. lunch. And he's thinking, I wonder if these guys, I don't know the bear's voice, but I, I, I wonder if these guys have any fish, you know? Yeah, I'll just gladly take their fish. Uh, good, good thing, because the photographer said neither guy had any fish. But they had no idea that death was right behind them. Wow. You know, this could be your week. You're so distracted by your life, you're not paying attention that, well, the devil could be likened unto a hungry bear prowling around. He's right behind you. Good thing your grandma's praying for you. You know, good thing your grandpa's praying for you, your mother's praying for you, or you're praying for your dad or whatever, because who knows what's right behind him. Be persistent because Christ was persistent. Number two, Jesus challenges us to be persistent. Uh, Luke chapter 11, interesting little story. And I love the Lord because he was not boring to listen to. I mean, don't you hate that monotone teaching uh, you know, I'm going to talk to you about the joy of Jesus. It's so wonderful. The <laughs> joy is to follow Jesus. And the guy has no joy. You're like, hello? You don't look happy? You know, to listen to Jesus, it was like awesome, but also entertaining. Because if it's, if it's humorous, you start laughing at something, and then he nails you in the humor. Has that ever happened to you? That was Jesus. Notice after he, in Luke 11, after he gives us the Lord's Prayer that we all know with reverence, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We can all quote it, right? Even non-Christians know this verse. But what came after that? This little story came after that. Jesus said to the disciples, I'm gonna give you a scenario. Suppose some of you shall have a friend and that friend shall go to him at midnight and he shall say to him as he's knocking on the door of his friend's house at midnight, hey friend, uh, lend me three loaves. It's probably Roman mill back in the day. Um, <laughs> For a friend of mine has come to me for, on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside the house, his friend shall say, in a bear mind, in a Jewish household, they all slept in one bed. Mom, dad, children, and then all the animals were all around them. Imagine that. So keep that in mind as you read what the friend says from inside the house. Do not bother me. Why? The door is already shut and my children are in bed with me uh, and I can't get up to give you anything or else I'll wake them all up. He says, I will tell you that even though he won't give up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he'll give up and give him as much as he needs. Take all my Roman meal, man. It's go away, all right? And I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. He who knocks it shall be opened. Oh, we typically stop right there. Oh, I get the picture. So God just wants me to ask, seek, and knock, and eventually he'll give me whatever I want. Is that what he's telling you? No. He's telling you, you must knock on the door of heaven. You must ask and seek. And I will give you things sometimes you, that you're specifically asking for. But notice the proviso in verse 11. He says, now, let me tell you another story to help you understand the last story. Don't you love his teaching? Yes. Thank you. Five people were listening to me. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked of a son for a fish because he's hungry. Will the father give him a snake instead of a fish? I mean, if your son says, Dad, I want a Big Mac, are you going to give him something detrimental? No. He says, if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion. Honey, I really tricked, tricked uh, Junior this time. You know, asked me for an egg out of the fridge. Gave him a live scorpion. Honey, he's five. No dad's going to do that. He says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? Translated, Jesus said, let me argue from the lesser to the greater. Will a father give his son what is the best for him? Answer, yes. yes. Don't you think the heavenly father is going to give you what's best for you? Absolutely. As I ask, seek, and knock, God might give me things that I uh, asked for, but sometimes he will look down from heaven and he will say, well, you're asking for this, mm, but I know you really need this. God ever do that to you? Uh, the Apostle Paul had an eye malady, probably, uh, he's partially blind, uh, probably from uh, uh, malaria that he picked up in Pamphylia on a missionary journey. And it, it plagued him, he couldn't see. In 2 Corinthians 12, he had a prayer with God. It says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations as that God gave him, he says, for this reason, uh, to keep me from exalting myself or being cocky, 
There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. He says, concerning this uh, malady, I entreated the Lord three times that he might, de that might depart from me. And he said to me on three occasions, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in, in weakness. Paul said, I knocked on the door of heaven three times. Lord, if you want me to be an effective minister, shepherd, pastor for you, I gotta be able to see. Could you please remove this vision issue from me? And God said to him, well, that's a great prayer to pray, but I know what you really need. What you really need is the soul to be conditioned. I need to condition your soul. You need to understand my grace is sufficient for weakness more than you have to have the ability to see. Is this not mind boggling? It's okay to ask for this over here, but God says you need something better. As a good father, he will give you what, what he knows that you need and it will be the best for you. This is a hard lesson to learn, but it's a great lesson. When I planted my last uh, church and had 19 members meeting in a school, I was 31 years old. I prayed over that church all the time. And I prayed the doxology of Ephesians 3 over that little church for almost 20 years. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in, in the church and in Christ, in Jesus Christ, uh, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let it be so. I prayed that over that little church plant when I had 20 members, when I had 40 members, when I had 80 members. I prayed over that church when we had 180 members. I prayed it over that little church when uh, an evil couple split that church and took 106 people with them, with them and rebooted the ministry. I still continue, God, would you exceedingly abundantly bless that little church? But in my young pastoral mind, I'm thinking, God, I want to impact lives, grow this church numerically. And God's looking down from heaven and going, nice prayer, but it's not what I'm interested in. God's like, I'm interested in your, in your character. I need to humble you. I need to deal with pride. I need to make you the kind of man of God I want you to be. And it's going to take 20 years to get there. I didn't know that. I prayed for this and God said, no, you're asking for an egg. I'm going to give you this. And it's better because I know it's better. So through, through difficulty and trial and, and conflict, God shaped the shepherd. And what's really interesting about the ways of God is the numerical growth I was looking for didn't come until I moved across the country. <laughs> because then when I got here 12 years ago, in November, 12 years ago, I didn't come here looking for numbers. I just wanted to be a shepherd of sheep and teach the word of God. Because God had already worked in my life for 20 years. And then God said, let me give you what you prayed for years ago. Let me give it to you on the East Coast, not the West Coast. You'll impact lives here in a way that I want you to impact, but now you're ready to do it. I wasn't ready back then. Isn't God great? You pray this and God says, no, I, you've been asking me a lot for that, but I, I, need to, I, need, I need greater things in your life. And it's gonna be through hardship you shall learn them. You praying to God and waiting for him to do great things, he will. He will teach you much and he will make you ask constantly so your faith is deeper. Because if he gave you exactly what you wanted instantly, your faith would be shallow. So he makes you wait and ask so that when he does move in a profound way as he did here in this church, I can then stand back at a shepherd and say, glory goes to you, God. I mean, all that you've done here, glory goes to you because it's not about us, is it? It's not. Which leads to my last observation. What's keeping you from being persistent in your prayer life? I mean, what is it? What is it? I'll give you two ideas in case you have no idea because you might be sitting there going, I am totally clueless, clueless as to why I'm not persistent. Uh, two ideas. Number one, it might be unconfessed sin. I speak from experience. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard wickedness in my heart, he, God, will not hear me. Like if I look at my life and I know there's sin in my life and I haven't confessed it, God's looking at me. When I'm asking for X, he said, I'm not gonna give you X until you deal with the sin. So I would say before you leave this place to worship, you gotta get real with God to say, God, cleanse my vessel. Then he'll hear you. Number two, you might be distracted. You're playing, not praying, because you're distracted. I found some stats I found most interesting this week. 45% of the world's population spends a daily two and a half hours and 23 minutes a day on social media. Could you imagine if, if, if all those people spent two hours and 23 minutes alone with God Almighty, what would happen? And you might think, well, I'm not into social media. Okay, well, what, you're into gaming. Well, how much gaming do people do? A uh, typical child in the United States plays games for two hours and well, 2.13 hours per day. 
92% of all parents let their child play one hour a day games. 8% allow them to play five hours of games per day. What are we training the children in? How not to approach God because they're so distracted. Television. How, how much TV does a typical American watch? Five hours and four minutes per day. Certainly not here, correct? We're way too busy for that. Five, could you imagine if you spent five hours and four minutes a day before God's throne? Imagine what would happen in your life. Years ago, there was a group of young men uh, at Wheaton College uh, who learned about the persistence of prayer. Uh, they ran it, it was back in 1947. They, the, a lot of these young men were soldiers. They came back from uh, World War II, attended Wheaton College, and they ran into a janitor who only spoke German, nur Deutsch, no English. They tried communicating pretty soon, couldn't talk to him. So they began to pray for his soul, thinking he was not saved. So they began to pray for him every day for several years while they were in school. Uh, the men of the group were formed as a group by a man named Jim Elliot, the great missionary who was eventually martyred for his faith. Jim Elliott and a couple of his friends prayed for this German janitor for years until they graduated. That was 1947. 1978, uh, one of those men that was part of that prayer team praying for this German back in 1947. In 1978, one of those men in that prayer team was the head of Billy Graham's uh, consulting firm for world evangelism. Uh, and he wound up uh, uh, going to England uh, for a world evangelistic uh, conference. He was the consultant. And while he was there, they assigned a, a German to be with him because the German was Billy Graham's head translator because uh, they were going to eventually go to Germany. And so they hooked this consultant up with this German translator and they had some free time. So they were cruising around England one day and they went down to the dockyards and they saw a British submarine. And while they're staring at the submarine, this is what the German translator said. I don't know if you know this, uh, but I served in Hitler's submarine corps. Uh, toward the end of the war, as the Allies were sweeping across Europe and crossing the Rhine into Germany, Hitler pulled most of us out of the submarines and naval vessels, which were no longer of much use to Germany, and put us on the front lines as infantry. Uh, he says, I was on the front lines in Holland, and I was wounded. That was the best thing that ever happened to me, because I was abandoned by our troops in retreat, and because they left me for dead, I was captured by the British. They sent me to a hospital in England, where I spent the rest of the war. The other part of my military contingent uh, retreated eastward and captured by the Russians and no one ever saw those young men again. He then told the young man he was standing there with, this consultant for Billy Graham, the guy's name was Peter Schneider. He said, uh, from England, I went to the United States and I couldn't speak any English, so I got a job at Wheaton College and I wasn't a Christian. And he said, from Wheaton College, I eventually left and went to a, a YMCA camp in Wisconsin where I, who understood English now, heard the gospel of Christ and I trusted Christ. And then I went on to be Billy Graham's translator in Germany for all of his crusades. <laughs> and who was he? He was the janitor who prayed for him. Four or five college guys got together and prayed for the soul of that guy and said, God, Save that Deutschlander. <laughs> Save that man. Who'd that man become? Billy Graham's key translator of the gospel to an entire nation. Who are you praying for? Who's your Peter Schneider? Let's pray. God, thank you just for the power of prayer. Uh, I don't think we are committed to it to the level that Paul is talking about. Some are. We have many people who are prayer warriors. May more of us learn what it means to avail ourselves of prayer before your throne. And might you do great things in and through the things that we pray. Might we live to see your hand move in a miraculous fashion and change our world uh, and, and conform us to your image in the name of Christ. Amen. God bless you.